Welcome to the Dave and Ed podcast. Today's guest is John Patrick Shanley, one-time Oscar winner, one-time Tony winner. What else has he won? I believe he's won a Golden Globe too. Yes. Or, and, yeah, I believe so. He's We're a childhood. Excited. Yes, he is. Very excited. He's a childhood hero of ours, an angry young man. And he still is, just like us. Yes. Just so a, you know. And he's going to join us any moment now. Very shortly. We're just waiting for him to join us so we can. Uh, um, how are you doing, Ed? I'm good. Are you I, excited? Yes, I'm very excited about this. Good. Thank you all for tuning in. You younger folks who aren't familiar with his work, you've got to get an education. And, Big time. Yes. Um, this guy's been around for quite a while. He won an Oscar in 1987 uh, for yeah. uh, the screenplay of Moonstruck, which was a fantastic film. Oh, here we go. Yay! Hey, it's it's John Patrick Shanley. Welcome to the Dave and Ed podcast, John. Thank hey, you for hey, John. How you doing? How you doing, man? You good? Pretty well, pretty well. It's a beautiful day. Good. My laundry. You did your laundry. That's good. That's the most important thing. Um, how, how have you been during this uh, COVID thing, you mean, Jake? Well, you know, I'm in contact with uh, a lot of writers. Right. And uh, almost universally, they're all saying they can't write at all during the pandemic. Oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. Really? Yeah, yeah. I I actually have been able to write, uh, but it's uh, it's very interesting to sort of see what you would write under such circumstances. Are and you writing your King Lear as Shakespeare did during the plague? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, no. I'm, actually, uh, I'm doing a, a compendium of a lot of different projects, little oh, cool. bits. Of, cool. And I just did a series of. Uh, monologues for dramatist play service for people to do during the lockdown oh wow and i got you know people like john Turturro and deborah messing and uh chris bauer and yule vesquez and daphne rubin vega uh, uh and ray seahorn to to do monologues that we could then post on the thing for actors to take a look at and you know maybe decide to do a monologue themselves on a video that's great awesome mm -hmm. yeah john could you talk to us a little bit about um your influences growing up in the bronx um and how they affected your early days in writing please um well i'm you know i was raised in an uh, irish catholic background in a neighborhood that was irish italian and jewish uh and predominantly irish and italian and uh, so the Catholic Church was a, a central feature, uh, as was the Irish culture for me, because uh, there was a lot of Irish music played in my house. My father played the accordion and my aunts and uncles would come over on the weekend and they would dance in the living room and everybody would sing or perform, have to tell a story or a joke or whatever. So the idea of performance and it being a kind of homemade thing was uh, instilled in me early on. Uh, and then when I was 13, 12 actually, I saw a production of Cyrano de Bergerac at Cardinal Spelman High School. That was a very good production. And uh, I was in, on a stage crew. So I would be in the wings listening to the play and the performances. And I discovered that that backstage quietude everybody tiptoeing around while the bright lights were just a few feet away that that really suited me um uh, there was a point in college when i did some performing myself and uh apparently i was good but i was like the the, the price is too high I have to walk through a wall of fire to get on stage and i you know after that nothing is worth walking through that wall of fire for me um, and so, you know, many, you know, many of the books that I read when I was a child and things that I was exposed to, all of those feed into your adult experience. And then the people, you know, that you just see these characters. Right. And also you have to figure out uh, how to get along with them. Right. Uh, very difficult, very difficult people uh, for a variety of different reasons. Some of them because of dogma some of them because of psychosis. Uh, and so, you know, I was raised uh, amongst many very violent people and uh, 
people who were borderline. Wow. Uh, uh, I figured out a way to get along with them. Uh, and I actually took pride in the fact that I could get along with anybody. And then later on, I said, <coughs> be careful what you're good at. Uh, and so I started to step away from the menagerie of mad, broken toys that I was hanging out with and uh, go, go in another direction. And what was the name of the neighborhood you grew up in, in the Bronx? Yeah. Well, we called it Archer Street, uh, which was a street, you know, where we all hung out. Uh, but it was the East Tremont section of, of, the, of the Bronx, in the East Bronx. Okay, okay. Could, could you talk about more about um, the characters you met in the Bronx outside of your family? Because, you know, it's a cliche to say New York has changed a lot. Me and Dave, obviously, have only experienced um, New York in the last 20 years or so. And, you know, I, I'm interested to hear your perspective on, on how New York has changed and um, how people well, got softer or whatever, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's always been five boroughs. Right. Uh, and what's going on in those five boroughs is different each from the other. Right. Uh, the Bronx, uh, for me, like when I was doing my first film, we auditioned uh, basically some, you know, real neighborhood people. Uh -huh. Is that, that uh, five, five Corners, that movie? Yeah, Five Corners was my first uh -huh. film. And it was very interesting because uh, I quickly developed generalities about the boroughs based on those uh, interviews uh, or auditions, if you might call them that. Uh, and um, because like w when a, a guy from uh, Brooklyn would say something that you thought was funny, he would, he would do it more. Right. Uh, and uh, when a guy from the Bronx did something you thought was funny, look at you and say, what's funny? <laughs> it's a whole different thing. You know? Really? <laughs> wow. That's great. Yeah. So you, were you that guy from the Bronx? Were you that guy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was a, you know, a weird amalgam of many, many things. I was, I was pretty widely read mm -hmm. uh, by the time I was 15. Uh, and I, you know, incorporated that into one part of my being. And then, uh, the, you know, I was dealing with this other thing. I was more reactive in terms of violence. So if I felt like you were threatening me, I might try to kill you. Right. But, but if I didn't think you were threatening me, I wouldn't, you know, get involved in that side of my personality at all. Right. Uh, and uh, but also I, I learned very early that engagement is kind of the key to violence so that uh, if I'd be like in a bar and a guy be trying to catch my eye, I would instinctively know if that guy catches my eye, we're going to end up rolling on the floor. So I became very good at not noticing that some guy was trying to catch my eye. I could look right to the left and right of the guy. I could look at his ears, never into the guy's eyes. And the guy would get more and more frustrated and try harder and harder, sometimes getting as close as a foot and a half away from me. Wow. I still couldn't see him. Uh, and they, those guys, if they didn't see them, they'd give up and walk away. Right, wow. Do you think if you saw them, they'd go for you immediately. Right. Yeah. Do you think that reactive thing is, is part of being Irish? Do you think? Um... Yeah, because because me and Dave describe ourselves, even though we're both, um, I'm almost forty, Dave's forty, and we we joke and we say we're going to be angry young men forever. And uh, we're just wondering, is there still some of that in you to this day? But yeah, so that's a two part. Well, question. I would say the part of me that was Irish uh, is I, so there was a thing that would happen, you know, that occasionally, uh, you know, I would get attacked, uh, and uh, uh, either verbally or physically or whatever. And I had the habit of when I was attacked of convincing the guy that I had no intention of responding. Right. And then I'd take him out. Right. But for, and, that's, that was, and I think that was Irish. Are you, yeah. Are you Boston? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'd relax. I'd be like, look, we're two for in the same. Right in the middle of talking, I'd punch him in the face. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, just to switch from like, because what's, what's so uh, interesting about a lot of your writing is there's the violence, but there's also the amazing, like deep romantic side as well. So I'm just curious, like, was that always there from like, as when you were a teenager? Like, when did Absolutely. you- Absolutely. Yeah. That was there from before I was a teenager. You okay. know, that, that idea of the constellations and what they did to me when I saw the stars in the sky, uh, that was always there. The moon always moved me in ways that I could not explain. Uh, and uh, as did uh, lightning bugs and uh, greenery against the blue sky. Uh, that beauty uh, was, for me, first of all, a private matter mm -hmm. uh, because trying to share beauty initially did not end well uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and then uh, at another point, I became aware that I could, but I had to be clever. Right. Uh, I would employ language and charm and mischief. And also I cultivated a certain uh, uh, persona that I was a little crazy and that I didn't mean the things I said. Yeah. And so I developed this tone that I was lying, except I was telling the truth. Right. And that confused people for many years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the, after. the beauty you speak of, like, uh, was that beauty valued? In the, in, in the Bronx when you were growing up? Interesting. I think that, you know, on some level we're all the same. Right. Uh, but, the thing, but the thing is that, you know, you have to find a, a viable avenue to another person uh, where uh, through along which you could transport from you to them uh, an aesthetic experience that gives you joy or sustenance. Uh, and uh, a lot of the sort of uh, easy ways, let's say sentimentality, those were not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so you had to find something that was actually living tissue between you and another person. And so, because the yeah, I mean, I would say the people that I grew up in the within the Bronx and my family were much more grounded than I was. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that I constantly had to try to find ways to climb down the ladder from where I was like dreaming to relate and connect to these other people. And since that was very important to me, connection was very important to me, I, I uh, would do what I could to, to make that happen. Amazing. Right. Thank you. Yeah, right. So, so we're interested as well in the, the day jobs that you had before the success happen as a writer because I used to move furniture and I read somewhere that you move furniture and I'm like a skinny kid and I was wondering were you a skin like it was funny for me I was moving furniture with a lot of tough Mexicans so I was like the odd man out it looked ridiculous mm -hmm. um but yeah did you move furniture you were a elevator operator I believe Is that yeah you? yeah I was uh uh yeah I was a moving man and uh, actually I wasn't uh skinny I, I probably weighed like 190 pounds I was oh, wow. very Okay. I'm an ex-Marine. I was very strong. Right. Uh, but sure. I worked with three guys who were all rugby players. And they were 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and 6'6", six, six, the three <laughs> of them. Wow. Uh, and they would, you know, and I was, I was a big guy. I was a strong guy. And they would say, don't let John pick that up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I was their end, you know? Right. Uh, and, uh, uh the and and, and I, the, you know I had to look. It was like looking at the skyline in New York. There was something. Uh, right. So I I would you know I'd let that go and I would I would do my work. But I had many jobs. I didn't call them day jobs. I called them shit jobs. Sure. And, uh, yeah. You know, and I have you know two sons, and I always said to them, "There's nothing better than a good shit job." <laughs> Because, you know, if you, you need a few of those, you'll draw on those experiences for the rest of your life. Right. Uh, and uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to say they did go out and get shit jobs. And not enough to suit me. I would have liked to see them get more shit jobs. But I saw I was a house painter. Uh, I did a lot of that. Uh, and uh, uh, I was a moving man. Uh, and every morning, get up at like five o'clock in the morning and go to the, on the train 
to the Bronx to my old subway stop. Huh. Uh, and wow. then down to this weird garage that was down by the freight train tracks. And uh, there was, I remember there was one guy who lived in that garage. Uh, and he, I come in and he was like naked to the waist. He had like grease on his face <laughs> and his pants were tied with an electric cord from like tore off from like a television set. And so the plug, the plug was still hanging from it. And I was like, that guy never leaves me. To this day, I think about that guy. Wow. I thought, plug himself in at night, you know? <laughs> but sort of read, because he was like full of vivacity as well. So I did that, yes, and I was an elevator operator. I was on maintenance crews. I, I, did, well, I did a lot of heavy manual labor, and I did that from the time. And I, oh, big job that I was, I was a sandwich maker and a relief manager for a sandwich shop chain uh, wow. in Manhattan. And that was hard work. That may be the hardest job I ever had. Right. And I did, that, I did that for quite a while, and I met a lot of very colorful characters there sure uh -huh. and can you talk to us a little bit about boot camp yes Murray. Uh, well boot camp i mean you know when i was uh 19 i was uh 1a which means that you were eligible to be drafted into the military it was during uh the vietnam war towards the latter portion of it uh and uh i had a a, a low lottery number so i was going to get drafted and I, uh, I thought about it, and I, I asked guys, so, you know, what's the army like? And they said, boring. They all like said boring. And uh, then uh, I, so I asked people that I knew about the Marine Corps. I said, is the Marine Corps boring? And they would they'd get this funny look at their eye, and they would say, no, it's not boring. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to the Marines. They had the two-year program open at the time because they were running out of people. Uh, and so I went in for two years and uh, I was 19 and it was the end of the 60s you know it was 1970 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I went in and uh, got my long hair cut off wasn't that long but it was long enough and took off my gaudy clothes whatever and mismatched you know I never was a good dresser and uh, uh, you know we all had to wear the exact same thing. We all had the same haircut. If you wore glasses, you all wore the same glasses. We spoke in unison. Uh, and uh, I found it to be a totally spiritual experience, like joining a monastery. Wow. Uh, and uh, over the, you know, basic training was 10 weeks, and then advanced training was another like three and a half months. Uh, and so I was in training for six months. And by the end of it, I, I had found some grounding that I, I didn't have before. And I was very grateful for it. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. Uh, and uh, you have to have 13 months left to go to Vietnam. And so when I reached the one year mark, uh, and I, my plan was if they told me to go to Vietnam, I wouldn't go, I'd go to jail. And, uh, but they never ordered me to go. Right. And so the year went by and it began to prey on my mind, you know, what if they had ordered me, maybe I'm full of shit. Maybe I, maybe I would have just gone on now and now I'll never know. Right. And about that time I got an order to go to driving school and I went to battalion headquarters and said, cars are killers. They're polluters. I, they've killed my friends and I won't drive one. I have a <laughs> conscious objection to driving school wow. and the Colonel <laughs> Just, he didn't, he, and like after like a very long silence, he said, I'm going to grant you this conscientious objection to driving school, but I don't know what the fuck you're doing in the Marine Corps. Right. Uh, and I left the headquarters. And by the time I got back to my barracks, which was, you know, a 10 minute walk away at the most, everybody, everybody in the back. And everybody in Camp Lejeune heard that somebody had gotten a conscientious objection to driving school. And they were all like, this is the end of the Marine Corps. It's the first thing they said. <laughs> and the second thing they said was this had to be Shanley. <laughs> and they were right. It wasn't the end of the Marine Corps, but they were right about it being me. Um, so it was a good experience. GI yeah. Bill paid for my college education. Right. 
Is, is it true that you, you wrote a novel and burned it after? Yes. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I wrote a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, I wrote a tremendous amount of poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then, um, uh, and then uh, after the Marine Corps, I started to send out poetry to all the magazines that publish such things. And uh, after many rejections, I got uh, uh, two of my poems accepted for publication. And actually, I was at lunch in a bar with Jimmy Breslin and Calvin Trillin and James T. Fallon uh, 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 in, uh, for a, and a friend of mine, Terry Moran, with all these like literary guys. And I was, you know, I was, tw I was 22. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, f the bartender came over and said, you have a phone call. And that's like from a movie as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for, uh, who even knew? So it was my then wife. And she's calling to tell me that I got these poems published. And uh, everybody at the table got very excited, you know, because they were sort of there, you know, to encourage uh, young writers. And here was one of them actually having something happen. So I did that. And then, of course, I immediately stopped sending out poetry. And then I started writing short stories. And then Paris Review said, not this one, but maybe the next one. You know, we're, 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 we're enjoying what you're doing. And so I stopped writing short stories. And then I was, uh, wrote a novel. And then I did that for a year. And then I read it. And I went, this has no plot. And I burned it. Oh. Uh, and um, all of that is part of, you know, everybody has a different road to walk as, right. a, as an artist. And mine was definitely, I had a lot of bad writing to do. Right. Um, I wrote some, to me, interesting poems right at the beginning of when I was writing. Yeah. And I wrote a couple of interesting things uh, along the way to this, to writing the novel that was no good. But uh, it was only when I uh, started writing, uh, first I, uh, I, uh, I started writing plays. I wrote a full-length play, and it was immediately uh, slated for production at NYU. Uh, and they went into rehearsal like three weeks after I wrote the play. And that's the kind of additional energy that I needed. I didn't, you know, if you're a poet, if you're a novelist, you're in a room by yourself forever. Yeah. And uh, that turned out, that, that did not suit me. Mm -hmm. So um, I found my form. I was probably 22. Uh, and then I, I, start, I started writing a lot of, you know, I wrote uh, a lot of 10 minute plays because I was in directing classes and I could write the play and direct it immediately. And then I was writing full length plays as well. And I was off and running, but it took me, you know, that, then that went on for 10 years. Uh, I had one very good production of a pretty good play early on, uh, my first professional production. And uh, nobody reviewed it. It got one review from like a very small paper, and the review was good. But basically, nobody saw the play. Uh, what, what, what play was that? I didn't, it was called Saturday Night at the War, and it was about my time in the Marine Corps. Uh, and it was an uh, interracial cast, and it was produced by Vanette Carroll's theater. Vanette Carroll was a big uh, black uh, director. Um, uh, who did like oh, Arms Too Short to Box with God and Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And she had started this theater called the Urban Arts Theater or the Urban Arts Corps. Uh, and they wanted to do my play. And they so they thought, after reading the play, they thought I was black. <laughs> <laughs> okay. wow. there was a lot of black characters featured right. in the play. Right. Uh, awesome. and, uh, and the audiences, you know, who were, and it was kind of great because... These were, you know, a very small theater, but the audiences were probably 60% black. Cool. And I've missed that ever since. You know, that, you know, I felt was a major vital part of what I was doing. The, what a, the black audiences would give back right. uh, was really kind of thrilling. Um, uh, yeah. That's really cool. Like, it, that kind of leads me to a question kind of regarding 
what's kind of going on, what can come up a lot these days, I find in the theater world of like, you know, uh, regarding race and stuff, of, you know, how dare a white man write for a black man or whatever, like this kind of thing. Um, you never came up against any of that from any of the African-American actors, like you don't know how to write for black people or whatever, or it was just universal. Not too you know, much. You know. Uh, you know, there's a couple of things that I have done where I kind of cringe. Sure. Uh, you know, um, actually one in particular, and that's in Joe versus the Volcano, where uh, oh, Ossie oh. Davis is playing a chauffeur. And it was a failure of my imagination that, oh. uh, you know, I knew I wanted a black person in a featured role in the film, but it's a failure of my imagination that, uh, even though it might reflect the reality, uh, uh, that I would have Ossie Davis, who was such a giant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. he was, Brilliant. He gave he gave the funeral oration for Martin Luther King. Yeah, yeah. And Malcolm X. Yeah. You know, that's yes. living history. And right. it was major playwright and uh, uh, enormous career as an actor. He was really something. But, I mean, he never said a word, of course. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and I had talked to Spike Lee at one point, because Spike and I were right. friends. Cool. about maybe doing the part. And he said, they'd kill me. He's like, if I play the <laughs> chauffeur, they forget it, you know? Uh, and, you know, and I, I understood what he meant, but I didn't understand what he meant like I understand now. Right. You know, I was younger and didn't know as much uh, about certain things as I know now. Right. Because uh, the Marine Corps, and this is one of the reasons why national service is such an important and great thing, because of the Marine Corps, I was in a barracks with, um, I would say, minimum 50% black people mm -hmm. for a year or two years. And uh, you, you, know, you learn a lot. Sure. Uh, about, and that was, those were rough times. It was like massive uh, racial unrest. So I got to Camp Lejeune a few months after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, there had been riots at Lejeune, and it was not pretty. There was an, an unbelievable level of tension on the base. And there was, there was one week where three guys were murdered in one week on the base. Uh, so it was, um, it was a volatile time, but I treasure it. And also I spent a lot of time with, you know, dirt poor Southern guys, a lot of Southern guys in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you sort of learn a lot about your own culture by being what, watching the incredulity in the faces of other people. That's how you find out that what you're doing may be strange to them, or say right. may be strange to them. Right. Yeah. Um, Danny and the Deep yes. Blue Sea. Uh, talk to us about those characters. Did, yeah. Did you know when you were writing that one that like this is the one? Like, did you know this is fucking amazing? I'm gonna. It, it just, no, I. You know, well, I. I it's hard to it's hard to say how you know what what you consciously know because apparently right. people told me stuff afterwards like um uh i mean when i was writing doubt i just wrote doubt and uh while i was writing it uh apparently i talked to a friend of mine and uh she said i said yeah i think i'm probably going to win the bullet surprise for this play and i had no recollection of saying that and certainly none of thinking uh -huh. it Wow. Or of thinking that anybody would be interested one way or the other. I, I just, you know, that was the next play that I was writing. Uh, when I did Danny, I was in a very explosive place. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I had a desperate feeling of need, needing to break through, not professionally, mm -hmm. not artistically, but as a human being. I felt trapped in yes. some kind of precondition and I wanted to enter the present tense uh, and I didn't at the same time accept my own feelings. And so I become more and more alienated and more and more angry and lonely and all of my emotions had gotten to such a dead end extreme that you know sort of like uh, a drought and like one match and the whole thing's gonna go up and and danny was the whole thing going up uh, mm -hmm. yeah like it's such an amazing play i mean like you know almost 40 years later 
like when I started acting in Ireland in the early 2000s, like it's in every acting class we see actors working on scenes from, you know, Danny and Roberta, those two characters. And it's like, it's just like, it's an actor's dream, I really believe, for a male or a female. And like, I'm just wondering, did those two characters, were they, were they based on, was the female character based on any relationship? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the, both characters were heavily based on people that I knew, uh, then and myself. You know that I things I identified with in them that I felt myself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I knew this one guy, um, and he got in a fight with this guy on the street uh right off Archer Street. And the guy he beat the shit out of the guy. And this is the middle of the afternoon, right? They got in a disagreement, one thing led to another. They duped it out. The guy that had started the argument went down. And then the guy's uncle came out mm -hmm. of the house. What the fuck is going on here? And he came out and him and this guy Ronnie they got in a fight wow. and Ronnie beat the shit out of him. And then the guy's other uncle came out. This went on through six guys. Jesus. He like took out six guys, one after the other wow. and was really disappointed. There wasn't a seventh. Right. Wow. You know, he was just like ready to pop. Wow. That's amazing. And he, he was a big uh, uh, model. Right. For, Ronnie, wow. Yeah, what Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie was in Moonstruck as well, right? Yeah. He, yeah, he made an appearance in Moonstruck. Yeah. Through, yeah. Through, through the <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's amazing, like, when you were saying that, like, I was laughing and Dave was, it's, like, is it an Irish sensibility, you think, that, like, we can make such intense, violent stuff like that funny? Like, I laughed, like, to be honest, John, I watched Five Corners, your first film for the first time on Thursday night. It's on Amazon Prime, just a yeah. nod to our viewers. You can watch it there. Yeah. Uh, and like the scene where Totoro throws his mother out the window, you know, I started laughing. Obviously, it's not funny, but it was just like, fucking hell. Yeah. It's got to that point. And like, how, how do you, my question is, as an artist, how do you pull that off without it being like uh, bleak and fucking glib, you know? Like, well, first of all, when I saw the film, yeah. I clapped my hands with glee and stood up laughing when he threw her out the window. Right. <laughs> I deserved to go out the window. Yeah. So, yeah. Did, so did we. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> my fiance yeah. didn't, though. <laughs> <laughs> She's not here right now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. well, the thing is, I think, you know, the, I think that what the, you know, one of the things that the Irish are good at is enjoying whatever the hell's going on. Right. right. If they're dying, they're going to find a way. It's like, okay, well, I might as well enjoy this. Right. You know, uh, it, what, whatever, you know, you look for that, you know, if, you, if you're living under a leaden sky for nine months at a time, yeah. if you look for that one little piece of sunlight that comes out, it goes, <laughs> and you'll look for that. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, because you need it, you know, you need it to get through the day. Right. Uh, and I do, and I was I'm, I remember being in basic training and these drill instructors <laughs> just so extreme. I remember my uh, uh, close combat drill instructor who was uh, demonstrating the art of gutting somebody with the bayonet, and I was like, "How in God's name am I going to get through this without falling down laughing?" Because right. uh, the guy was funny. He was funny. Right. He's yeah. like. You worked really hard to get that bayonet in him. Don't be in a hurry to leave. <laughs> Look around in there. I'm like, oh my God. I was just like, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. what am I going to do? Burst into tears? Come on. That's amazing. Wow. That's cool. And uh, uh, so I guess Moonstruck was your, was Moonstruck your first real, real introduction to Hollywood? Uh, well, um, or maybe Five Corners was, I'm not sure, but. Well, Five, five Corners was, uh, you know, I first, I, Five Corners was my first film. Yeah. And uh, uh, Five Corners wrapped and shooting, and Moonstruck started shooting one week later. Mm -hmm. Wow. So uh, they, you know, they, this was all 
happening very, very close together. And uh, when uh, Moonstruck came out, a lot of people perceived it as, uh, you know, my first film. Because right. Five Corners had come and gone like in a minute. Right. They had like this really weird, obscure ad campaign, and I think really no money. Uh, and they just, you know, put it, I was out there for a couple of weeks and then it was gone. Uh, and it was, but a year later, it came out on video cassette. Mm -hmm. And I was out in Los Angeles and I was at like a very surreal Christmas party uh, thrown by Dolly Parton. Uh, that was the ultimate Hollywood party. Yeah, I've never sure. seen it before or since I've never seen anything like it. And as I was, there was like a little receiving line. Dolly was at the door. She had a choir behind her uh, singing cr uh, Christmas carols. And she was greeting people when they came in with her friend Sandy Gallon. And they'd say, would you like to have a picture with Dolly? And so it was a little slow getting in. And online, while I was waiting, Neil Simon came up to me and said, I saw Five Corners last night, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, just so appreciative wow. and Sean Penn and Madonna same thing Michael York came up I just saw five court it was like my coming out party but it was right. a year oh. after the film came out wow yeah. uh, that's funny uh, um yeah what, what was I going to ask about that uh Moonstruck um, yes so like w winning the Oscar for Moonstruck uh what was it like being be being celebrated like that it was uh, really enjoyable. It was like, you know, I, when I won the Oscar, I realized, as I was like, I, I, I went up on stage and kissed Audrey Hepburn, got a bear hug from Gregory Peck, and I turned around and I saw, you know, this giant audience full of everybody I'd ever seen in a movie or a television show. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized, thank God, before it was too late, I don't have to defend myself. This is one of those incredibly rare moments in life when I'm safe. Right. And I, I got to remember to let this in and just enjoy this. And I did. And I'll be forever grateful that I came to that idea in time. I've watched people win, and I can tell they're just completely defended. Wow. And they can't let it in, you know, yeah. because they're so used to protecting themselves from the almost endless assault that every artist goes through that when that moment comes when they're safe and it ain't gonna last long, uh, they're not gonna remember in time that they, that they don't need to shield. Uh, right. And yeah. I'm very happy at that. It was great. Yeah. yeah. And did you have fun that night after? At the after party? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I went did you to, have a drink? Uh, I went to Spago's. <laughs> okay. uh, Norman, Norman Jewison got me in. He said, just hold the Oscar up. Keep waving the Oscar <laughs> So I did, you know. Yeah. At the party, I found Audrey Hepburn and kissed her again. I thought, well, I don't know what, if I can get away with it. Uh, I felt very clearly that she thought one kiss had been enough. But what are you going to do? She couldn't stop me. Uh, and and I had a good time. Yeah, I had some drinks. I I, I don't remember, you know, drinking to excess that particular night. Um, it was just, and then the next day, you know, like this enormous tropical storm that's now passed, all was quiet, you know. Right. I'd had to do like um, an enormous number of interviews and stuff right. leading up to the Oscars, uh, though it's very different now than it was then. Uh, and um, uh, the day after, this photographer said, can I take your picture with the Oscar? And I said, sure. And we went down to the swimming pool. I think I stood, uh, sat on a diving board or something, and he took a picture. And we were the only ones out there. And after he, you know, after the picture was taken, it was just me. Right. Wow. Yeah. Very quiet. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it, it seems like it was effortless, but was the uh, transition from writing from stage to screen effortless, or did like how did you teach your, did, did you teach yourself, or did you? What were just studying films? Yes, I did, I did teach myself. And yeah. as far as screenwriting goes, you know, first yeah. of all, we've all been in screenwriting class our whole lives. Some of us learn better than others, but we've all been watching movies and TV right. shows sure. since we were kids. 
Uh, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I was like when I was a kid, I'd always be saying we'd watch some te- television show and I would predict what was going to happen next. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. You know, yeah. so I was already, you know, thinking about plot as many kids do. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, the, the, and that, that's the kind of uh, tradesman mechanical level of writing is super necessary. Uh, and then it turned out I was, a, I was a very artistic person, though I couldn't, I didn't know what that meant. And uh, I certainly, in, uh, you know, to begin with, like in the Bronx, uh, I would never say that I was an artist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I actually went further than that because I said I was a poet. Right. And that, like, just saying, punch me in the face, <laughs> you know, in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, putting together the fascinating thing and putting together the artistic side with the absolute nuts and bolts side that's so necessary in playwriting and screenwriting and frankly in uh, in novel writing. That's uh, that's a lifelong pursuit of putting things that don't necessarily completely go together. You get them to go together. And that's, that's a very interesting struggle. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it, it's always felt to me like you've had a very original voice. Like we spoke about your influences in the Bronx, childhood, etc. But what influences did you do you have as a writer? Like Dave was in before COVID nineteen destroyed us all. Uh, Dave was in rehearsals at the Irish Rep for a touch of the poet Eugene O'Neill. Mm-hmm. What do you think of O'Neill? Um, was O'Neill? It's one of my favorite plays, Touch of the Poet. Oh, is it really? Well, you must go when it, when when this is over. Go see Dave. I can't do it. We'll comp you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I saw Gabriel Byrne do it. All right. Uh, yeah. And oh, my right. God, he did a great job. It was a very, it's a it's a extraordinary play. What what the journey that that guy goes on, and the uh, O'Neill's ability to. Uh, so history and character together in a very visceral and personal way Mm -hmm. and being Irish and being American and throwing off repression of a certain kind, Uh, even though, you know, by the end of the play, he might have voted for Trump. Uh, (laughs) Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jackson is probably the closest thing. Yeah. Andy Jackson, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, so would, would would he be an influence or not? Would he would he like? I you know I mean influence. I don't know how to answer that, and I'll tell you oh, yeah. why. Because he's uh, you know, I mean, is a towering playwright, right? An extraordinary, important American playwright, uh, and in a way, what playwrights and artists in general do as they come along as they're young and they come along they look around and they look for unclaimed real estate and they say that's where i that's where that this is the missing thing and i am the missing thing Mm -hmm. i'm going to do that Mm -hmm. and so o'neill claimed a certain piece of real estate that I had no interest in going near, right? Nor could I, right? It, it was very particular, uh, and you know, some playwrights are more dangerous to a playwright than others, you know, sure. because you look at it and say, I kind of could be, I kind of could do what that guy's doing, mm-hmm. and you know, that can get in your way of finding your own voice. Tennessee Williams might have been such a person for me, but. Actually, you know, and I probably had some like little Williams kind of things going on and stuff that's never been produced, uh, but not much because again, I just wasn't Tennessee Williams. I was something else. And Arthur Miller, when I was young, I thought Arthur Miller was boring. Uh, right. Now I'm like, hey, the guy's a fuck. He was amazing. Even, but again, even when he was like with Marilyn Monroe, he thought he was boring? <laughs> well, actually, I thought, you know, and this is much more recently, I thought yeah, yeah, sure. Arthur Miller, his career ended with Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. He, you know, because he um, didn't recognize a fundamental truth is you can't marry a dream. You can't 
Right. And when, if you can't marry your muse, and if you do, no good's going to come of it. And and uh, indeed, he yeah. they, he was not. He never he never had a major player cut. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So true. Yeah. So yeah, we'll get to doubt in a second, but after Moonstruck, you know, like I read somewhere that you said this guy thinks he's James Lipton. I know, yeah. I'm like this new <laughs> my new my new I found my new calling job, Mr. There you go. <laughs> I can do everything. I can act, I can clown, yeah. I can Well the real estate's <laughs> available again. Oh yeah, that's right. James Lipton is he's gone. He's gone, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I, I read somewhere that you said, you know, like you only made like five grand from uh, Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, which I assume kind of instilled the practicality in you, like regarding, hey man, the money's in the film or whatever. Like, so after Moonstruck, there was a few Hollywood kind of like Joe versus Volcano you mentioned and um, I, The January Man, I believe you wrote the screenplay too. The like, January Man. Yeah. Which is a very good film, I yeah. think. But, uh, Congo. Con Congo. Well, Congo was later. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. let's just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was the chest? Because We're dinosaurs. I loved that one when I was a kid. Remember that? I remember, I remember uh, we were doing the January, man, and it was a writer's guild strike. Yeah. So I couldn't go, right. you know. And uh, they, were sh they were shooting up in Toronto, and then uh, uh, they did a press junket in New York after the, you know, when the movie was going to open. And also the studio got taken away from Alan Ladd Jr. Uh -huh. while, you know, while uh, the January Man, right at the, like, January Man premiere. Um, and uh, they just, they just dumped the film. But as Susan Sarandon said at the press junket, they asked her, you know, how does she feel about the film? And she, and she said, they cut 45 minutes out of the film. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and it's like, so she was like, what do you think I think? <laughs> uh, uh, God bless her, you know, she was pretty straightforward. Uh, so it, yeah, I, I don't by any stretch of the imagination think that the the january man came together the way it was supposed to at all uh and the director who was very good on some other things he was an irish director guy directed cal uh, yeah uh and uh, but on that one he fell off the bicycle that was not okay he didn't he found a, he found a wife on that one but he did not find the film uh and then with congo I remember seeing the rough cut of Congo. It flew me out to LA, and I looked at it, I thought, all our careers are over. <laughs> this, is, this is just because I was shocked that they, you know, I, I, I'd been involved, very involved in certain parts of the pre production process, you know, but then they went off and they made the film, and I was not there and i then i see the rough cut and i see that what they did was they had guys in hairy suits jumping out from behind trees and rocks and i was like no don't tell me you know because uh, yeah. yeah, as we all know animals m move faster than people uh, and these guys were like literally guys moving <laughs> like guys but guys encumbered by hairy costumes and i was like this is just i'm scared to death you oh, know uh and then you know so i gave my notes and we did the best that we could and everything else and i didn't know what to make of it i went home it was the biggest opening in paramount history i was like the the director is like one of the nicest people i've ever met and very gifted in many ways frank marshall he called me and he said biggest opening in paramount history oh. and i said what the fuck <laughs> uh, so you know that but you know certainly I would not say that that film is particularly representative of like the kind of thing that I sure. am interested in, in doing by and large but I haven't watched it since and you know for all I know I might like it now uh, uh, you know there's a lot of good people involved in do, trying to do good work uh, uh, and what else? Alive, uh, Frank Marshall directed. Oh, that's, yeah, we were gonna, yeah, yeah, that was good. I and know. that was, I was very pleased with that, that came out. What do you uh, think of We're Back, a dinosaur story? 
uh, we're back. I was in, I, Spielberg produced that movie and uh, we, it went on for like two years. And then, you know, I was getting calls from Steven all the time. Uh, thing, you know, the, the scene should be a little different or maybe we should have a scene like this, blah, blah, blah. And again, I thought like two, after the movie was done, Stephen was still calling me and saying, you know, maybe we need a scene like this and that. And I was like, and they got to be like, I don't know, two and a half, three years this was going on. Oh, wow. And I'm like, and then finally the producer called me and he said, listen, ask for more money. <laughs> I've never gotten that call any other yeah, time. Yeah. It's like, because I'm like, Brilliant. this movie never ends. It just keeps, you can just keep thinking. And because he's Spielberg, they're like, oh, okay, you know, and they'll just keep. So, um, and I remember I, Stevens, you know, I said, well, I was sort of thinking of somebody like Walter Cronkite for this part. Calls up Walter Cronkite. So I got Walter Cronkite. I'm like, oh. you did? And I was like, okay. And I uh, said, so I was thinking of somebody with a voice like Julia Child. Like, I called up Julia Child. We got her. Wow. I'm like, I, you actually got Julia Child? <laughs> I didn't even know she acted. Uh, uh, and so that side of it was kind of mind blowing. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't seen that movie since it came out. I, I think it's okay. Yeah. Well, Maybe you, got, you know more than I do. <laughs> yeah, when I was a kid, I loved it. Um, but I guess, yeah, you're answering the question, though, which was. I guess my original question was the practicality of making more money, you know, paying the bills with. Well, like, I've been, you know, a life, you know, in the entertainment field, I have schemed every day of my entertaining life right. of how to stay in the game, right. what to do next, how to keep it interesting for me artistically, how to make all the money that I felt that I needed, you know, adopted children, everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. I had real estate stuff. I had divorces, you know, and as they say, divorce is, is uh, the sport of Kings. Right. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, but that side of it is stimulating and it keeps you interested now, you know, I mean, right now I'm doing these monologues uh, for video for dramatist play service with actors for the lockdown. Cause that's what's going on right now. Right. Yes. You know? So there was never, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know, I got a movie in pre-production, post-production, uh, Wild Mountain Time. Yes, and, uh, you know, that's um, coming together very nicely, I must say. Yeah. But leisurely, because we're, you know, this whole lockdown's going on. And so right. people, you know, the people, the, the cutting process has just sort of been drifting along. We're right. down to like tiny things now but it's still it's sort of drifting along because they're like oh you know let's let's give it a few days and talk about it again and then we'll do it you know the editor they bring the editor in for a week they'll lay them off for a week <laughs> so let's see how long we can keep this going and then after he finishes them you know we'll, and then i heard an expression on this that i of my my friend and producer on this leslie or dang She's always got an expression I never heard of uh, in uh, show business. She's got the latest show business expressions. Yeah. And so she said, well, you know, by the end of next week, I think we can have a soft lock on the film. Soft lock. Okay. You know, as opposed to the lock picture. It's a soft lock. I'm like, right. soft lock. Okay, that's, you have now come up with yet another thing I never heard of. But I immediately understand what it means, you know. That's right. Uh, so, you know, that's going on. So, you know, I'm writing my short story. I do my little videos. I'm in post-production on the film. And I'm, you know, I'm watching the news an awful lot, but only in the evening. Right. Uh, and reading the hard copy in the daytime. Because this is a time for intake. Mm -hmm. yes. Rather than, you know. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. I, I have to quote you now. I'm being very James Lipton because you brought up the news. Uh, this is a, one of my, this is a fantastic quote you, this is something you said in an other interview. I read the newspapers to see what isn't in them and I want to write about on that. Um, brilliant. Uh, expand on that. So it's like you're taking what isn't there. Is that like you ignoring the propaganda, the negativity or? or, or no, no. Not so much uh, that. You no, know, I mean, because it's the full range. 
You know, there's the, there should, certainly there's propaganda, there's a lot of lying, there's also a lot of truth telling. There's the usual full blown cacophony, all 88 keys on the piano playing like there always is. And you are listening to it all. And you're, if you're like me, you're always going like something's missing. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And that's why most of the writers I know aren't writing right now because they're doing that. They're going on. Uh, and when they figure out what's missing, that's them. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what they bring to the table. How, how, do you, how does one figure that out? Could you divulge? You have to have a, uh, you have to have some uh, confidence yes. uh, in letting time burn up before your eyes. I mean, there's been a number of times during my career where I have uh, felt terrified that I would not be able to pay my bills, that I would uh, be a, a, a failure as a viable artist in the community and all of that stuff. And I've pushed that all to the side. Like, you know, you really like, you think it's a five alarm fire and I better do something right now and push all of that to the side and write a poem that no right. one's ever going to see. Right. Because that's the next thing that I had to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I always sort of say, what's the next thing that I have to write? Right. right. You write that. Yeah. And that leads to other things. And it may just be, you know, three lines or it may be a very long piece or maybe whatever, but it leads to the next. And if you don't write that, you're not going to get to the next thing. Right. So you have, to, you have the vitality and the fearlessness to write things that maybe aren't for people to see or to be performed or whatever. Great. So, yeah. So we're, we're coming up on an hour. Yes. We and are. Uh, yeah. to get to more stuff um, like post nineties um, and talking about doubt and, and, and I'd also like to talk about um, Savage and Limbo. Can we, can we have you back in a few weeks? For part two? <laughs> We're businessmen. <laughs> sure, we'll try to make it happen. Appreciate we that, appreciate John. Appreciate that, John. That's yeah, amazing. Very, um, it's nice to meet you. I'm Dave. Yeah. This is Ed. This is the Dave and Ed podcast. Yes, yes. And thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, man. You're a legend. We love your writing, man. Thank, thank you, John. Thank, thank, thank you, John. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Yep. Thank you. Feel very, very, very good. Uh,